All right. Well, welcome back to Dorset Shoals Wednesday Night Live as we continue on with our Wednesday night lessons. And I just want to remind you of what we're doing. We've been going over the last few weeks. We're going to continue for a few weeks more. Going over 23 progressive Christian statements that were made on a progressive Christian YouTube site called Ragamuffin TV. Now, these were statements that this man who wrote this made that were supposed to give insight into what progressive Christianity, at least in his mind, uh, what progressive Christianity teaches. Well, this idea we've been going through and taking a look at some of these, and, you know, I thought it would be an interesting thing to look at because this teaching is infiltrating our churches, and we need to make sure that we see these things and see them for what they are, which, let's really be honest, is just pretty much heresy. And so we need to be able to identify these things when they come out of our leaders' mouths and make sure that, hey, wait a minute, this is not right. This is not what we believe. And so the thing is, we're going to take a look at these and continue on. We've gone through the first seven, and now we're going to continue walking through. And I do want to remind you that this was not something that I just came up with on my own. This is something that I've been watching on a, um, a website that I watch a lot, and that's Alicia Childers and Mike Winger, who are going over these same exact ones. And uh, now they're going over them very quickly. They have like a little three-minute segment. I thought it'd be interesting for us to kind of go a little more in-depth with them. So if you're interested in that, you can look up Mike Winger on YouTube, and you'll find these on his channel. But the first question we're going to look at today is question number eight. Question number eight says this, when will Christians realize that heaven and hell are not little or geographic places, but states of consciousness? Well, when we look at this statement that's made, first of all, if you've been with me and watching these, you're like, wait a minute, didn't they say that hell was a metaphor a couple of questions ago? Yeah, it's one of these things. Yeah, they've already said that they don't believe in hell. So why the restatement of it? Well, I think the reason that he's restating this is because there's a quote that is being attributed to Pope Francis. Supposedly, Pope Francis has said this, that heaven and hell are not literal geographic places, but states of consciousness. And so when I heard that, you know, I saw that this is why this guy's putting this in here. I said, well, okay, I'm not going to take this guy's word for it because I disagree a lot with what he's saying. And so I took a look to say, did Pope Francis really say these things? Well, as I looked and did a little research into it, now, number one, the Vatican says that absolutely no, he did not say this. And when they show the interview, or not show the interview, but when they talk about the interview where he supposedly said this, the person who interviewed him uh, kind of gave it under false pretension. Yeah, he's an atheist man who said, you know, hey, I'm something that he wasn't. And he interviewed the uh, Pope Francis. And when people were saying, well, where's your documentation? You know, did, did, you know, what did you write down? He said, well, I don't write down anything. I don't take notes. And so it's like, okay, so you're just saying that he said this and we're going to take your word for it. So, you know, it's one of these things you just look at and say, okay, that's, that's a little suspect. But the thing about it to me is this. Number, I think there's two things we have to answer here. Number one, why would he want to use Pope Francis as a, you know, as this is what he said? Well, obviously, he wants someone with some kind of spiritual authority to say, look, I agree with progressive Christianity. So that's why he's pulling this out, to say, see, someone agrees with us, even if it's a little suspect. So it's one of these things that's interesting. He wants a spiritual authority to say, nope, you're right. Heaven and hell aren't real. The thing that's interesting to me is he wants to use an earthly spiritual authority to override the heavenly authority, the true spiritual authority. He wants to override them by using an earthly man. Now, if you're a Catholic watching this, I'm afraid we're going to have a moment of disagreement here because who is the Pope? The Pope is not infallible. The Pope is just a man, just a man who is sinful, just like I am, a man who is fallible, just like I am. And to put something on him and say, well, you see, he said it, so it must obviously be true. There's no heaven and hell. It's like, what are you doing? And so the first thing you say is, why on earth is he putting this in here? Well, because he wants to have some kind of spiritual authority to back up his statement. The second thing we'd kind of look at and say, well, why on earth are they saying this? Is because, again, they want to discount spiritual authority. They want to discount the Bible. They want to discount the teachings of Jesus and say, well, the Pope said it. But even though Jesus said there's heaven and hell, then forget it. You know, it's, it's one of these things you just look at. And so that you see this on both sides, that he just wants to use this to support his position while meanwhile attacking traditional Christian beliefs of heaven or hell. So we take a look at this very first one. And again, you see it, it's just like he's just reiterating what he's already said, but he wants to use it to try to back it up by saying that this came from Pope Francis. Well, the second question we're going to look at today, and we're going to kind of run through them a little quicker because a lot of them run very similar. 
Uh, question number nine, it says this penal substitutional atonement theory is absolute dog and that he uses an expletive. God did not send Jesus to die on the cross for your sins to satisfy his wrath. He did it to satisfy yours. And so when you look at this, a couple of things you might look at and say, okay, number one, what is penal substitution atonement theory? Well, this is the thought that Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that God put his wrath upon Jesus to satisfy the wrath that he had so that we could be saved. Well, the thing is, as you can see, this man is absolutely doesn't like this at all. That's why he feels the need to use an expletive. But of course, remember the first question, he said it's okay to cuss. So, you know, in his mind said, hey, look, I'm being intense because I'm cussing. And so you look at that very first thing, you see that he has a little bitterness or maybe even some anger towards the atonement theory. And you would have to say, why? And I think that's a very important question to kind of ask. Why is he so upset with this? And why is he using this idea that Jesus didn't die on the cross to satisfy God's wrath? He did it to satisfy ours. This idea that we are so bloodthirsty and we're so sinful and everything that we needed blood. We needed a pound of flesh. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Where are you putting us on the scale then? You know, last time I checked, we're below God, not above God. God did things to satisfy himself, not to satisfy us. But yet they're sitting there saying, nope, that's not what happened at all. You see, one of the things that you'll look at with progressive Christianity is they have a real problem with the atonement. They have a real problem with the resurrection. Um, if you saw my first video about defining progressive Christianity, I showed you the idea or showed you the example of where a Sunday school class for little children was teaching them that, you know, it's not really doesn't matter if the resurrection was true or not. You know, that it's not really there. It's a metaphor. We shouldn't really put a lot of stake into it. And it's like, well, why not? Because let's really be honest. The resurrection is the linchpin of Christianity. If the resurrection truly happened, then Jesus is who he said he is. And everything he said about himself is true. So when he says that he is the only way to the Father, absolutely, he is the only way to the Father. If the resurrection is not true, if Jesus is still dead in a tomb somewhere, then everything about Christianity is false. So why on earth would they want to try to dismiss it? Well, they want to dismiss it by simply saying, well, it doesn't really matter if it's true or not. It doesn't matter. And it's like, wait a minute, it absolutely matters. Why would you be saying this, that it doesn't matter, that the atonement doesn't matter? Well, of course, what is at the core of progressive Christianity? Everybody's right. All religions are equal. All belief systems are valid. All lifestyles, anything you want to say is true, and no one can say it's not. Well, the resurrection sticks out there and says, here's your proving pen. This is exactly what it is. And so to say, yeah, the resurrection is true, is to say that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. So they must dismiss this. They must put it aside. They must get rid of it somehow. Because if they truly say, well, yes, the resurrection is true, then what does that mean? Everything else is false. All the religions are false. All your belief systems are false. Everything is false. And so they have to attack the resurrection. Another thing that's interesting to me is you see them with this idea of Jesus not dying to satisfy the wrath of God, but to satisfy the wrath of humanity. Really? You know, what on earth does that mean? You know, that we would look and try, and try to elevate ourselves so much as to say, well, look, you know, God looked at our need and said, you know what? I need to do what they want me to do. So I'm going to send Jesus to satisfy their bloodlust. Are you kidding me? But again, it goes to their mindset, the mindset of humanity first, of whatever the person believes is true and whatever they want to see happen happens. Again, also, it sees, sees the downplayment of traditional Christian value traditional Christian teaching, and that must be done away with so that they can make room for the new teaching of progressive Christianity. All right, so i got a couple of questions here about these, and uh, the first one kind of goes along that same vein. Why do you think they're attacking traditional biblical teachings? You know, it's one of these things you look at and say they're going after traditional biblical teachings, and the thing that's funny to me is at their core, they want to say, you know, all belief systems are valid. How come they're not attacking Islam? How can you, Islam claims exclusivity, that you're not going to get to heaven any other way except through Allah. But it's one of these things. They don't attack Allah. They don't attack Muslim. They don't attack anything. Only thing they attack is traditional Christian beliefs. Why do you think that is? The second question, I'm going to talk about this a little bit too. What does question number nine teach us about the author's feeling of self? 
Again, at the core is this idea that God did not send Jesus to the cross to satisfy his wrath, but to satisfy our wrath as humans. And so when we look at that and we see this man saying, yep, that's what he did, what does that say about this man's ego? What does it say about the general teaching of progressive Christianity about humanity versus the Lord? So I think that's an interesting one to look at. So y'all go ahead and take a look at that, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Good to see you. I hope that you had good discussion on those questions, and we'll continue walking through some more of these questions about, or not these statements, of progressive Christianity. So let's take a look at number 10. It says this, No one is saved because they picked the wrong religion any more than they are condemned because they picked the wrong one. Okay, now again, this is another question where it's almost like is the guy running out of ideas because all of a sudden he repeats really almost verbatim that, well, I think it was question number seven, that he talked about, you know, that, you know, you, you don't get saved because you say a, a magical sinner's prayer. And so he's really kind of saying the same thing in another way. Now, again, we would look at this, and the first thing we say about this, don't want to say it because they picked the right religion any more than they're condemned because they picked the wrong one. Well, I would agree with this with a certain caveat to it. Uh, number one, you don't pick religion. You pick Jesus, and Jesus picks you, if we really think about this. Because what Jesus does is Jesus, you know, he convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And we have that choice to say, I'm going to accept Jesus or I'm going to reject Jesus. Now, the thing is, you're not picking Christianity. You are accepting Christ. Sin is what sends you to hell. Jesus is the rescue from sin. And so we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And that is what saves us. And so, again, we see this idea where they're saying, you know, you got to pick it. You're picking it. You're picking it. It's like, no, you don't pick religion. You pick Jesus. You trust in him. And so, again, we see what they're trying to do is dismiss Jesus, dismiss what this is. Now, the thing I find interesting, I want to talk about just a little bit here. Um, you're, you're no one saved because they picked the right religion any more than they are condemned because they picked the wrong one. Now, I would look at this and say, okay, yes, again, you're not picking religion. You should be accepting Jesus. But this statement, they're not condemned because they picked the wrong one. Okay, let's really be honest. Okay, it, I, I guess I want to say it this way. You know, when you choose Jesus, you accept Jesus Christ, you become a Christian. That is part of Christianity. It is the right religion. Again, the religion points to who you follow. You accept Jesus. So I want you all to hear you don't pick Christianity, you accept Jesus. But I guess the thing I have right here, the, the issue that I have with this guy, is he, is there any condemnation? Can you just pick any religion, any person, and be, and any belief system and be okay? And again, when you understand progressive Christianity, you know that this is kind of the core of what they believe. 
that any belief system, whatever you want to believe, even if you want to choose no belief, you're not going to be condemned. Again, this goes back to the idea of universal salvation. All people are saved. All people are going to heaven no matter what. You know, all paths lead to the same thing. Even the path of the atheist leads to heaven, which is crazy. But this idea is they want to do these things. Again, it is also an undermining of Jesus' words when he said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So again, you see the attack they want to have. You know, again, the attack is about picking Jesus. Now, you don't have to pick Jesus. You don't, you don't get into heaven just because you picked the right religion. Agreed with that. You, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so they want to kind of have this idea that, nope, you're just going to go to heaven. It doesn't really matter. And so, again, you see the idea that they want to have of universal salvation. And now we get into the last two questions. We're going to talk about this one, then the last one will be the last segment. And this is, again, this idea about trying to get rid of traditional Christianity and get rid of the proofs of traditional Christianity by attacking the Scriptures. Okay, in question, or statement 11, it says this, Anyone who interprets the Bible literally needs to take a literature class. All right. You know, it's one of these things we look at here. Um, I would take out one word, and then I would agree with this. Um, anyone who interprets the Bible, I take out the word literally, needs to take a literary class. I believe that is true. You do need to take a literature class. But the problem that he has here is you see how he frames this very negatively. If you think that the Bible is literal, then obviously you're ignorant, and you need to take a literary, a, a literary class. And it's one of these things you just look at and say, okay, again, a very negative statement. But again, where is he going here? It's an attack on the inerrancy of Scripture. Because if you look at the Scripture and you say it's literal, then obviously you're ignorant and you need to get some learning under your belt. Well, the thing about it is this. What's he saying here? He's implying that you must interpret the whole Bible the same way, that everything must be done the same way. Now, the thing about it is when we look at this, we see, okay, we need to look at this and really see exactly what's going on. Uh, you know, y'all have heard me say this if you've been in a sermon of mine. The Bible says what it means means what it says. There's no filler material, things of that nature. The principles of Scripture are inerrant. They are going to be there. They're going to be teaching you. You can see it. You can trust it. You can trust the Bible and what it says. Now, the thing about it is we also need to understand a few things because if you interpret everything literally— and say, this is absolutely true, you know, that you're going to look and say, wait a minute, there's going to be some things that are going to cause you problems. Now, before you start getting pitchforks and start getting ready to get fired, Steve, I want you to understand something. There are things in the Bible that absolutely historically accurate, literal truth, we see it. And that is we look at the Gospels, the things of Jesus. Those are absolutely literal true. And so we need to understand that. But then we also look at some things that are figurative. We look in the poetry sections of Psalms and things of that nature, and we see that, hey, these things are teaching us, and they're not literal. You know, I, give it, I guess I look at it this way. Uh, when the Bible speaks about Samson killing 10,000 people, it's figurative. You know, it doesn't mean that he literally got to 9,999 people and said, I'll kill one more and no more. It's 10,000. No, what the Bible is showing us there is that he killed a lot of people. He killed a lot of Philistines. And so he wants us to look at that and see that. But then also the Bible speaks about counting the Israelites. That's literal, where we see that there is an absolute specific number. And so when we look at these things, we look and we see there is figurative language. There is a literal language. There's hyperbole. You know, when Jesus talks about if your right hand causes you to sin, then what you need to do is cut it off. Does Jesus really want you to cut off your hand, to pluck out your eye? No, he doesn't want you to do that, but he's showing you that it's such a serious matter that you need to do, treat it that serious. That you know what? If it really was that much a problem, I do need to do this. But is Jesus expecting us to walk around and maiming ourselves to it? Another example of this would be where Jesus says to hate your father and mother. Is Jesus, the author of love, the author of the family, saying, yeah, hate your father and mother. You know, go punch him in the face. No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is you should love God more. He uses this hyperbolic language to really drive the point home, that our love of God should come over everything. And so when we look at these things and we see, oh, yeah, there are literary devices in, in, in interpretation of Scripture, then we need to see that. This man saying here right now, if you read it literally, then you're ignorant. Well, the thing about it is you can read it literally understanding the literature that you're seeing. 
that yes, when I read the Psalms, I'm going to read it as poetry. When he says that he killed 10,000 people, I'm going to see this as figurative. I'm going to see this as hyperbolic language. It doesn't change the truth of the matter. It doesn't change what the Bible is teaching us. It just shows us there's different literary means to show it. And so to just simply sit there and say, if you interpret the Bible literally, you need a literary class. Well, the thing that he's trying to do again here is attack the inerrancy of Scripture, the literacy of looking at Jesus, looking at the Word, and saying this can be trusted and followed. Because again, what's their point? Low view of Scripture, low view of Jesus. And so we need to take a look at that. So got a couple of questions for you on here and take a look at this. Number one, what is the end game with this mindset? I think I might have gave it, to, uh, gave it away to you already. But when you look and say, you know, what is the mindset of trying to say that religion, you, you can't pick the right one and no one is condemned, things of that nature. And then the second question, why the attack on the literal translation of the Bible? Why do you think that they have such a hard time just simply saying, yes, you can trust it and follow it? Okay, so y'all talk about this for just a moment and we'll be right back. As we continue on, we're going to look at this last question or question, the last statement that he makes. Y'all forgive me. I keep saying questions. I mean statements that they make. We're going to take a look at the last statement he makes. And this too, again, goes to interpreting scripture. And this is what he says, the four primary hermeneutics for scripture. And so he just kind of puts it out that these are the four that you're supposed to follow. These are supposed the hermeneutics of scripture that you're supposed to do. Well, the first one he says is literal, then moral, allegorical, and then anagological. And so when we look at these four, and we'll explain them a little bit, he says this is the only way that you're supposed to be. You can use these tools to interpret Scripture. And so it's one of these things that's very funny to me because, again, we look at this guy who wrote these, and you can see that he's trying to dance around a lot of stuff because he just said if you interpret the Scripture literally, in the last question, in the last statement, if you interpret the Bible literally, you need to take a literature class. And then in the very next statement, he says the four primary hermeneutics for Scripture, the first one is literal. You can look at it literally. Um, the Bible says what it says and means what it says. Um, you know, and so we look at it and you know, I would look and say, absolutely. I would say, number one, if you're going to come and study the Scripture, you have to have this hermeneutic in you at all. And a hermeneutics is this idea of you know, how do we study, how do we understand the Scriptures, how do we look into them and study the background, the grammatical, the contextual, everything. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But it's funny to me that he dismisses literal translation in the last question and then says, yes, you can look at it literally. Now, again, I think that to really understand Scripture, you have to come at it from a literal viewpoint. So you come at it from a literal viewpoint. I would agree with that. Absolutely. That is one of the tools of hermeneutics. And then he says moral. 
to look at it morally, that's one of the hermeneutics to understanding. That absolutely is not. Because his point and what he wants to say is that mankind's feelings of right and wrong can then therefore be put as an interpretive event. That we can look at it through morality and say, okay, well, because we say this is what it means now, my morals say this. You know, you would see this a lot in progressive Christianity that would look and say, well, I don't have a problem with a person's lifestyle choice. The scripture does, so my morality overrides the scripture. And so that's why he's putting that in there. Morality is not a biblical hermeneutic to use. Uh, one of the things we can look at, and, and, and I know that you know, we have our points with this, but the morality of man changes, unfortunately. You know, things that were considered good and virtuous now seem to be considered bad. Things that used to be bad and evil are now considered virtuous. So when we look at it and say, well, the morality of man is going to determine things, man, we're in some wrong times because that's going to be some bad things. And so we need to make sure that we understand that morality is not one of the hermeneutics for Scripture. The third one that he uses is allegorical. Now, the thing is, I would look at this. Now, if he's looking at all of Scripture, and I haven't talked to this man, of course. If he's saying that all of Scripture is allegorical, which is one that you're starting to see. You're starting to see where people are saying, ah, oh, well, you know, the creation story is just allegory. Satan's not real. He's just metaphor. Now, if you're looking at all of Scripture and saying all of Scripture is allegory, that Jesus never existed or Jesus said these things and he didn't really mean something, you know, he was just using this as an allegory, then I do have a problem. But if you do look at Scripture and say there is sometimes that the Bible uses figurative language, uses allegory, then I would agree with you that sometimes it does. To understand where that is is an important thing. To understand the Psalms, to understand the poetry language and things of that nature, yes, it's understandable to, to use this. But if you're trying to apply it to everything in the Scripture, then again, you're erring. And then this last one, anagological. Now, I think the thing about this is what this one is, is applying a spiritual context or spiritual connotation to the text. Now, at first, we would look at it and say, well, yeah, we'd agree with that because the Bible is a spiritual book. Now, I agree the Bible is a spiritual book. But when he's writing this, what he's talking about is this idea of looking at everything in the text and bringing out some kind of spiritual meaning to you about this. You know, and saying that everything means something, that every number has some kind of secret hitting meaning to it, that everything that is said has a spiritual meaning to it. And, you know, I know this one is kind of a hard one to get to and get around because we're talking about what kind of does. Well, the thing is we need to understand that sometimes what it says is just what it says. Um, I actually saw this on a friend of mine's Facebook page. They had posted something on this, and I thought it was interesting because it spoke right to this. And the teaching that they had been taught was to go out there and get life, to go out there and get this because God goes before you. And we're like, okay, that sounds good. That sounds inspiring. And then the book was Judges. Well, then when you look up the scripture, you look at it, and what God is simply saying is this is being told to the Israelites, go and fight because God goes before you. He's simply just saying, God's going to fight for you. God's going forward for you to the Israelites, okay? He's saying it to them. Now, the person is looking at this saying, oh, God goes before me in my battles. Now, again, we can look and say, well, I can understand that thought process because God does go. God is going to lead us. But that's not what that verse means. It's very easy to take this and start using it and to take it down very unchristian paths when you start to say, well, everything has some kind of deeper spiritual meaning to it. I think you see a lot of books like this where people look at the, the biblical numerology, where they look at all kinds of numbers and say, this means something and this means something, when really there's no meaning there other than what it obviously means. You know, yes, Jesus fed 5,000, okay? He fed 5,000. People look deeper into it and say, well, the 5,000 means this, and because of 5,000, you put this and you take this number and do that. No. And they're trying to put some kind of spiritual, deeper meaning upon something where it's just saying the spiritual meaning is Jesus fed 5,000 by his own power. You know, and so there's a, a, a thing that goes there. Now, again, why would they want to use this? Well, again, it opens up that interpretation to themselves that they can look and say, well, I think it means that. I think it means that. And that's what it means. And that's all it means. And so when we look at this, we see these four things. Again, we can uh, see a couple of them that we would look at and say maybe, and then a couple that we absolutely totally disagree with. But again, it goes back to the idea of they want to affirm Scripture as they see fit. They want to judge it and say, well, I like this, so that's good. I don't like this, that's not good. 
And they want to wrap it up in spirituality by saying, look at our hermeneutics. We're looking at this, adding it to the logical. And it's like, that doesn't really matter because Jesus affirmed the scriptures. He affirmed what they said. He told what they said and that they can be reliable and trusted. And so we put our faith and trust in that. So when we do look at what is biblical hermeneutics, what are the biblical hermeneutics we should be doing? Well, the first thing, and I said a little while ago, it should be interpreted literally. We should look at it and say, God said it, God means what he says. If we come at it without a literal thought, what do we start to do is we start to poke holes in things. And we see that. We see when we look at John 3, 16, oh yeah, absolutely, that's literal. That's God's words. But then when God tells us not to do something or tells us to deny ourselves, then we say, oh, but that's not, that's not though. You see, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say, I lump the good parts and that's obviously God breathed. And then look at the other parts and say, well, no, no, I, that's not, of course. You know, where he says to live your life a certain way and to sacrifice yourself to him. No, that's not what that means. But him dying on the cross for my sins, hey, that's good. I'll take that. So the Bible has to be taken literally as you look at it, as you go forward with it. It needs to be interpreted literally. Second thing you see, it should be interpreted historically, grammatically, and contextually. So when you look at it and you're looking at the scripture, you need to see this. The first thing you look at it historically, okay, you understand the culture, the background, and the situation of the text. You know, it's one of these things we look at and we say, you know, what did this mean to them? You know, when we look at the first Corinthian church and we look at first Corinthians, we've got to understand he was writing that to the first Corinthian church. They were having all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. So to sit there and say, you know what? Okay, first Corinthians, we're going to use that in our church as a guideline. Wait a minute. If your church isn't messed up, if your church is not having problems, then you're going to look at this and say, wait a minute. He wrote this to a church having problems. Our church isn't having these problems. Now, of course, we can use it as a guide to make sure you don't have these problems, follow the principles that he's trying to get them to do. But so many times what people try to do is say, oh, yes, he meant to say that because this is what it means to us. No, we have to look at it in the historical background and culture of what's going on there. We need to look at it grammatically. This means we need to know what the words mean there. You know, the knowledge of Hebrew and Greek having that, to understand the language that he used in talking with them. You know, we can understand that in our own world about how someone from a foreign land who hears us talking about, you know, different things of our language, you know, they might not understand it. There may be a trip up on a word because they don't understand our word. So we need to understand the words that they used back then when God inspired the scriptures to be written in order to be able to do it. Now, does this mean that we can't understand it? No, that's what translations come from. The translations are translating these words and bringing it forward to us. And again, we look at the Holy Spirit that leads us in this process of truly learning. And so we need to make sure that we're doing that. And then finally, we need to look at it contextually. Um, the verses before it, the verses after it, the whole chapter, the book, and then its place in the Bible. You know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, when you see what I do is I try to go through a whole book at a time. Because we can understand it a whole lot better when we can understand chapter 1 as long as we understand chapter 12 too because we see the relation in that whole book. That's one reason why I tell people a lot of times when they're trying to do Bible study and stuff is don't just let the book open, read one verse, and say, there you go. Now, sometimes God can use that, but it's important to understand everything that's going on. You know, what happened before it? What happens after it? What happened in the context of the whole book? What happened in the concept of the whole scripture? And so it's an important thing for us to do that. And then the third thing to look at true biblical hermeneutics um, is understand that Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture is never going to contradict itself. It's never going to sit there and say, oh, well, in this book it said this, in this book it said something totally different. So we need to understand that these things are going to back each other up. They're going to absolutely interpret themselves to say and it's going to give credence to it. It's going to acknowledge it. It's going to make sure that you see it as the truth that it is. So the big thing about Scripture is never going to contradict Scripture. So when you look at one and say, oh, well, this says this, if it's not backed up somewhere else, you may be missing the context of this. You may be missing it. So understand that Scripture uh, you know, will never contradict itself. It interprets itself. And so that's one of these things. Now, a lot of people would look at it and say, well, you can't do that. You can't interpret yourself. Well, again, we look at it this. This is Scripture. This is much more than what we just think of as a normal book. It is the Holy Word of God. And so we understand that God protects his word, that God leads his word, that God guides those who are reading his word with a true and honest heart. 
And so we, number one, in all these things, when it comes to biblical hermeneutics, we take it and say, Holy Spirit, you lead us and guide us and show us what we need to see. All right, so again, I know that was a long one there, but we're going to talk about this, get a couple of questions. Uh, why is it important to interpret the Bible literally? Okay, I think I might have given you the answer in that one as well. And then the second thing, why do you think progressive Christianity wants to use moral and anagological as a hermeneutical method? Okay, remember we talked about that, that they had that, that the moral, the, our morals will help to determine it, the anagological, that everything has a spiritual meaning no matter what it is. And so why do you think they want to use that method when interpreting Scripture? All right, so I'll talk about it for just a moment. We'll be right back. So as we come to the end here, you've seen uh, these things. Now, again, if you've been with me for the last couple of weeks, you see these things repeating themselves. And the whole core of it is what are they trying to do? Trying to attack traditional Christian beliefs. You look at it, their first and foremost thing, they're attacking the resurrection. They're attacking the atonement. They're attacking Jesus. They're attacking the statements that he said about himself and what the resurrection means. The latter part of what we talked about tonight, you saw how they're attacking the scriptures, how the scriptures are not to be literal. You can bring your own saying to it. You can bring your own morals to it. You can make it say whatever you want it to say. And again, we look at these things and say, why? Why as progressive Christianity are you doing these things? Why are you trying to tear down traditional biblical beliefs? Well, I think it's the same reason that they wanted to use Pope Francis. You know, they don't want to just outright say, yeah, just do whatever you want to, you know, be whatever you want to be and then come and, you know, pay tithes to our church or whatever. They want to use that Christianity name, you know, because when you look at it and you really dig down into their teachings, they're like, you have nothing to do with Christianity. You sit there and say you extol Jesus, but yet you say Jesus is the same as Allah, Buddha and all that. You never call him Lord. You only say he's teacher Jesus. You say that heaven and hell aren't real. You say all these things, but yet you keep calling yourselves progressive Christianity. Why is that? Well, again, I think what it is is people want to have that name because they understand that there's something true there, that in deep in our heart, and I, I truly believe this, that God has written himself upon our heart, and deep down we seek him and we try to find him. And the thing about it is this, he's obviously out there and he's looking for us too. And the thing is, when we see this and we understand and we understand there's something different about Jesus. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that we live in a world where when you see all these other religions and all the, you know, especially new age beliefs, they do something with Jesus. No one dismisses him. You know, there, very few do. There's a few that would look and say he's nothing. But the thing is, just about every major religion, every major belief system does something with Jesus because they know they can't get around him. They know they can't get around him. 
They can't just say he's meaningless, he's useless, because it's written on our hearts. And so what you have is people who say, oh, yeah, well, Jesus, he's part of us too. You know, in Buddhism, he reached enlightenment. In Islam, he's the prophet second only to Muhammad. And it's one of these things that we can't dismiss him, so we better include him. We better include him in this. And I would say the same thing goes on to the PC Christian, the progressive Christian who looks and says, we can't just get away with him. We just can't do away with him, so we better add him in. So call yourself Christianity even though your beliefs are not Christian. You deny him. You deny his resurrection. You deny the power of his spirit. You deny the power of the word, and yet you still call yourself progressive Christian. Why? Because you're a charlatan. Because you are a flim-flam man who is trying to use this just as this author did. Try and say, yep, Pope Francis said this. So what? Who cares? You're trying to use some kind of authority to back up your point when the true authority absolutely disagrees with your point. And so we've got to be very wary of this because these mindset can come into anyone where we start to extol ourselves. We start to lift up ourselves. Because you know, I think that's one of the things, I know it was one of the questions that you talked about. I think one of the things we look at is the absolute pride and arrogance that's at the core of progressive Christianity that says we know better than God. You know, God said that this lifestyle is wrong. Well, we know better. God said that this way is wrong. Well, we know better. God said this is the only way. No, we know better. And so at its core, it feeds into the pride of humanity that humanity would say, yeah, we know better. And the sad part about it is this. This is why it's so intoxicating because so many people fall for this every day. Because every time we sin, every time we choose to do it our way versus God's way, at our core, what are we saying? I know better than God. Yeah, he told me not to do these things, but I know better. He told me that I would only find happiness and abundant life in him, but yet I'll find it in myself because I know better. So the progressive Christian has just taken this and keeps going down that path that says, yeah, you know, God didn't, you know, Jesus didn't go to the cross to satisfy his wrath. He would satisfy mine. Because I'm somehow a little more elevated than God. God must serve me, not me serve God. And so you see this all through progressive Christianity, but the problem that I really think about this, and a, a word of caution for all of us, is how easily we can fall into this trap as well. Yes, we may not dismiss Scripture, we may not dismiss the atonement and the resurrection, but we suddenly find ourselves doing things where it's like, well, I know better, I know better. Yeah, God certainly would want it this way because I want it this way. God is God. He is the Lord. We are not. That's why, again, I always say in Romans 10, 9, when it says, confess Jesus as Lord, it's not you giving Jesus permission to be Lord. Again, that goes to our pride. Well, I give you permission to be Lord. No, it's surrendering to his lordship and saying, he's the Lord of my life. I am no longer the Lord of my life. And so we need to make sure that we're always living that life. Because you're seeing it in progressive Christianity and why it's so intoxicating because it feeds into our pride. It feeds into our self. It feeds into our ego. When we need to sacrifice those things at the foot of the cross, we need to sacrifice our pride and our arrogance and our ego and give all things to God and be subservient to him and to him alone. Progressive Christianity didn't want that. Progressive Christianity wants you to be subservient to your beliefs, your morals, your wants instead of the Lord of the universe. All right, so again, you see the danger of it. We'll continue on talking about these statements over the next few weeks. Got a couple more weeks, I think, out of this at least, and we'll take more about it. But let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Father God, Lord, we come before you. Lord, as we continue to look at this, this, this heresy, Lord, of people trying to use your name, trying to use Christianity as a way to get their own way as a way to maybe get more people on their side to say that, look, we can, we can just make our own religion. We'll use Christianity as the, the name for it, but yet the beliefs have nothing to do with Christianity. And Lord, we understand that where this truly comes from is the pride of self, that we look at ourselves and say that we are the arbiters of right and wrong, that we look at ourselves and say what we choose to do is more important and better. Lord, what we're really just simply saying is that we're better than you. Lord, help us to always, whether we call ourselves a traditional Christian, a progressive Christian, Catholic, whatever we call ourselves, Lord, help us to always remember that first and foremost, we are your children and we should come under your guidance and leadership. That Lord, we do not surrender to a nameless, faceless God. We surrender to Jesus who died on the cross to save us from our sins. Lord, help us to remember that and to teach that 
and to not let pride and the pride of self get in the way. Lord, I pray that you would again, and I know I prayed it and I'm going to keep praying it, that, Lord, you would bring the people who are teaching this and you would bring them under conviction. Lord, for those who may be parts of these churches that are being under this leadership, that their eyes would be open, that they would see that something's wrong, that something is not right, and that they would question their leaders. And Lord, if they have to, that Lord, they would get out of there and find a church that truly follows you. Lord, I pray for those leaders who, Lord, are intentionally doing this, who are twisting your word and are making it something unpalatable who are making it something, Lord, that it's not what it's intended to be. Lord, I pray that you would bring them to judgment. And Lord, that their hearts would be opened and they would feel that conviction. And Lord, that they would repent of their sin and turn to you. That Lord, they would make sure that they get it right by stopping and denying self and accepting you. And Lord, help us as we look at this, that Lord, we would never fall into this trap. That we would daily take up our cross and deny ourselves to follow you to follow your ways, your teachings, and what you tell us to do. Lord, help us to not fall for this trap of thinking that we are on equal footing with you. Because, Lord, we're not on equal footing. You are God. You are perfect and you are sinless. We are sinful and we are wrong in so many ways. Lord, be with us and help us to see that and to live our lives accordingly. Again, Lord, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for the time. And keep our, keep our hearts and minds focused upon you and you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I do want to thank y'all for being here tonight. Like I said, we will continue talking about these questions for next week, and I hope that you are um, having a good week. Be safe out there and uh, look forward to seeing you on Easter. I hope that we will see you on Easter. We're going to have two services, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And we're asking that the 9 o'clock service be kind of the senior service for the seniors to come in. Uh, we will have some child care for like workers and stuff like that. And if you have to make the 9 o'clock service, we will have child care. But if uh, we ask for most of our families and stuff to come at 11 o'clock, uh, because we're still doing social distancing and stuff. But I hope that you're having a good week, and I hope to see you on Easter, and we will see you next week.